Welcome, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerili Marimov, New York University, welcome here. Uh, it's with great pleasure that we host this uh, screening, discussion and performance tonight. As you know, this uh, event is also part of the celebrations for the Day of Remembrance uh, that is observed throughout the city of New York, uh, actually exactly a week ago. Uh, celebration started with the reading uh, of the names of the Italian victims of the Shoah in front of the Italian Consulate General in New York. And basically, any major Italian institution in New York participates with one or more events uh, to these uh, series of uh, celebrations. As you remember, uh, just last week we had the screening of The Longest Journey, a documentary on the deportation of the Jews of Rhodes, uh, and uh, a, a very moving and, and engaging discussion with Stella Levy, who is here with us also tonight. And I thank her again for her generous uh, presence with us last week. Tonight, we have the screening and performance of Hiding in the Spotlight. Hiding in the Spotlight is a docu-film based on a book that I have here, the Italian version of it. La Pianista Bambina, that is the, uh, the girl piano player. And it's, uh, the English version of it is Hiding in the Spotlight. Uh, I don't want to tell you much more about the story because you're here to see the film. I just want to tell you briefly what to expect uh, from the evening. After the screening of the film, that is about 60 minutes, about an hour, uh, we'll have a chance to, it's no longer a surprise even if we thought it would be because we published it on our uh, website, you will have a chance to meet uh, Zana Arshanskaya, who is the protagonist of this story and that has very graciously accepted to perform for us a piano piece. And so we are looking forward to it. I had the fortune to listen to her today rehearsing while I was in my office and I heard the beautiful music coming from downstairs and I knew that Zanna had arrived. And then after that, we're gonna have a, a discussion with the director of the film, Flaminia Lubin. Where is Flaminia? She's hiding, but not in the spotlight. She's back there in the projection room checking that everything is okay. And with Greg Dawson, who is the author of the book on which the film is based and is also the son of Zana. So we have a full evening with the film, the discussion, and the piano performance. Please stay with us and enjoy it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have the pleasure to welcome to our stage and to our small piano, Zana Arshanskaya Dawson. Please welcome her.
So we have the fortune of having together the author of the book that recounted to the world the story of Zanna and the director of the docufilm that we have just seen. Uh, it's not easy to have this combination together. It happened at the Casa only once, but it was with an interval of 12 months. We had the author of the book, and then 12 months after we had the director of the film. So it, I believe it's the first time we have this combination uh, present. And everything is made, of course, even more exciting and moving by the presence of the real life protagonist of both the book and the film. But Flaminia, I believe there are in the audience some of your cast and crew members that you that might I want like to, to recognize. Yes. yes, I'm here to just to make some thanks. And uh, first to La Casa Zerilli Marimò and you, Stefano Albertini, Professor Stefano Albertini, that guest us this event. Then I want to thank all of you for I'm touched for coming under this weather condition. I want to thank Greg for your amazing book, Millions of Time Better Than My Docu Film. <laughs> and uh, I have a few people to thank, my actresses and actor. And I want to name some. Matilde Ferri. Please, Matilde, come here. And India Daniels and Barbara Beheida. Please, girls, come here. You are going to be actresses, so you have to learn how is the stage. I have to thank Flavio Arzilla, my editor and technical engineer. If uh, this movie was made, it's thanks to him. Thanks to the script writers, Benedetta Grasso and Eric McGuff. <laughs> thanks to the kids of Allen Stevenson. And thanks to Rabbi Salt from uh, Central Synagogue that let me film, actually reenact, the scene that I love the most. The one when uh, Zanna and Frina uh, perform for the Holocaust survivor of uh, Dachau concentration camp. So maybe I'm forgetting somebody. I'm sorry. But uh, now, uh, Stefano, I am done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would like to have these beautiful girls sit here so you can face them and you can see their beautiful faces and their <laughs> expressive faces They're facing you. They're not actresses, by <laughs> the way. Uh. Benedetta, vieni anche tu. Ma come no? Benedetta, as uh, Flaminia said, is one of the co-writers of the text. Please come. <laughs> qua, qua. And also because in this way we have even more empty seats for those of you who are standing. <laughs> and they're beautiful, beautiful faces to look at. Um, Greg. Flaminia said that she doesn't have anything else to say. We're going to ask her something, I, uh, but well we're going to give her a little I've break. Been ar I've been around know. here long enough to know that's not all she has to say. <laughs> I she know. Speak <laughs> but let me say, uh, I, I want to thank, someone who has not been thanked yet is, is Flaminia. And I just want to thank Flamie for her, first of all, her, for her great special interest in the book and, and for... Uh, Reading it and seeing there the possibility of a of a film, and um, she's the only one who's done that, and I'm great grateful for that. And but beyond that, um, just her execution of the film, and um, I believe uh, Stefano, you wanted to ask me some questions along those lines, so I won't go into that quite yet. Yes. But I want to say, that, uh, uh, in addition to all the ones that she has mentioned, that that Flami mentioned, involved in their parts in the film, I'm so glad to to actually have met some of the. Uh, but not the uh, but not the actors yet. It's wonderful to to see them to meet them for the first time. Also, someone who's not here, who I think I'd like to mention, and I think added a lot to the film was the was the narrator. I thought the narrator did an excellent job of of bringing 
uh, uh, the, the marvelous screenplay uh, to give it really to, to life and to, uh, as well as all the other aspects, the actors, I think that the, that the, um, uh, the narrator was, uh, was, was really extraordinary and Flammy found the narrator, I don't know where you found her, but she was great. So, so this she's Russian, she really was Russian. My mother would, and she, um, it was evident because uh, it was not only was her pronunciation exactly correct, but there was that special, that special, um, that special only Russian uh, passion uh, in some of those passages. But so, Stefano, yes, uh, I, I have a there. question for you to start, Greg. Uh, this is a, a very personal book for you, uh, not only because it tells the story of your mother, but also because it tells the story of your own coming to terms with it. First of all, finding out about it, and it was not something that you have always known and uh, you have always been completely aware of. And I found particularly interested these, your journey in coming to know this story and making sense of it, if there is any sense. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about that? Of course, the film is all narrated in the first person by the narrator that is the voice of, of Zanna, whereas the book, your voice is very present. So tell us something about how you first found out about this, how you took an interest, and how you were able to dig into such painful memories in your mother? Well, um, I didn't know anything about this story as you, that you saw on the screen today until I was about 30 years old. Uh, it was not uncommon for someone of my generation, um, growing up in the Midwest, Jewish growing up in the Midwest, to, to not know. Um, there, were many, there were many Holocaust survivors who did not speak about their experience. Many did, uh, but, there were, but there were also many like my mother who did not. And uh, I asked her uh, some years later when we were doing the book why she never told me and my younger brothers, five years younger, why she never told us about uh, really what was the most important thing in her event in her life when we were children. And her answer was quite simple. Uh, she said, I just thought it would be too cruel to tell children about, about things like that, events like that. W uh, that is a short statement that has a, a, a lot beneath it. But, uh, but that was her decision, and so I grew up without any sense of. I grew up in a secular home. She had grown up in Ukraine as a secular Jew. My father had been a Roman Catholic, grown up Roman Catholic in Virginia. Uh, but I grew up in a secular home, so I didn't have any particular racial or religious ethnic identity when I was growing up. We just didn't think about that back in those days. And uh, in Bloomington, in southern Indiana, I wasn't. I had no particular awareness of it, and um, all I knew was that on Sunday morning, uh, oddly enough, most of my Christian friends disappeared, and I had nobody to play with until the afternoon. They went to church, and I didn't, and uh, nor did we go to synagogue. But uh, because I had no sense of, of no idea that I was even a Jew, uh, uh, I never thought to ask my mother about her about the Holocaust, which, by the way, was not even a household word then in this country in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the first time it was even mentioned in the New York Times, was uh, used in the New York Times, was 1959 at the opening of Yad, Yad Vashem. But, so I grew up with any, without any knowledge of that. And I did, however, and this is kind of ironic, it, actually, even though I didn't know I was a Jew until, uh, until I was a teenager and I didn't know anything about this story until I was almost 30, I actually had a very Jewish upbringing um, because both my parents were in the School of Music at Indiana University and in those days, less so now but still, uh, but still noticeably, but very much so, virtually the entire faculty was Jewish. And, uh, and so w when we had parties at our home, uh, most of the most of the guests, their colleagues, and friends would come over were Jewish, and so we had. I was surrounded by Jewish humor, Jewish food, Jewish music, uh, Jewish culture, just no religion. So actually, I was uh, I had a very Jewish upbringing without really knowing it. My mother has always said about my father, who went to Juilliard uh, at 14, and it was immediately surrounded, going from rural uh, Virginia to to the Juilliard in 19, would have been 1928 or 29, where he's immediately surrounded by almost all Jews, again, as students. And on the weekends, uh, they would take him home to their mothers who would feed him, uh, you know, chicken soup and latkes, and he fell in love with New York, and that, 
and that culture. And she always said about my father that she, he was the best Jew that she ever knew. <laughs> so I didn't know about this until I was quite. So I found out about it um, um, really uh, the first time I found out about my mother's story that you saw here on the screen was really 1978 when NBC had a Holocaust miniseries. And I was a writer at the time, and I decided to see if I could work up a, a, a column on, uh, on this uh, miniseries because it was a very big cultural and TV event in this country. So my mother at the time was uh, living in Milwaukee, and I thought, well, I knew she had come over during the war uh, and uh, had been somehow caught up in it, but I didn't know anything else. So I thought, well, maybe she has one or two anecdotes that might relate to this. So I called her and I asked her about this. I said, do you have anything uh, you might tell me? And boy, did she ever. <laughs> that was 1978. So I wrote a long story based on that interview. But then, uh, but then I didn't do anything with the material until, until many years later um, in 1994. Uh, my daughter was in middle school and had an assignment from one of her teachers to interview a grandparent about what their life was like at the same s age they were. And our daughter only had one uh, grandparent left at that point. It was my mother. And so she said, told us about the assignment, said she was going to write to my mother, and we thought, well, good luck with that, because we didn't honestly think that she would confide much because she knew that she was really kind of reluctant to, to speak about it. But much to our surprise, uh, uh, my mother responded to Amy with a very emotional, heartfelt, four-page handwritten letter uh, expressing for the first time the real, uh, in a very an emotional way, what she had gone through. And that was like a light switch that went off for my mother. And from that point on, she kind of understood the importance of talking about the Holocaust uh, for to Amy, so Amy would know, her friends would know, and future generations would know. And there's a kind of a special relationship bond often between grandchildren and grandparents. And, um, and from that point on, she became much more uh, willing and then eager and then insistent on talking about her experience. She did a taping for Spielberg's Shoah Project and then some years later, we decided uh, uh, that we really should try to put this into a book. And we sat down. It only took eight years for me to get it done. And so that really is, uh, uh, that's really how it, um, how it came about, or rather, yeah. Seven years, from the time you were born. Seven years from the time we sat down for the first interviews to the time the book was published in 2009, yeah. And there are several parts, at least in the Italian edition, that's what I read that are in italics. Uh, are these parts that were written originally from your mother or transcribed from conversations that you had with her? Uh, yes, the in, the book, in the book, uh, as you said, uh, there are sections. Uh, the heart of the book are really my mother's words that are in italics. Those are verbatim um, excerpts from the interviews I did with her. And you'll find that she speaks English as she played, uh, uh, as she played Chopin and Debussy very colorfully very vividly, um, with, uh, with, gr with great feeling. And those are, those are not uh, sort of retouched quotes by me. Those are act her words verbatim, uh, excerpts from, from the interviews. And those are really the heart of the book uh, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to get back to you in a minute. I have a question for Flaminia. Yes, D is there an Italian soldier in the story? Flaminia, tell us Greg about it. Oh, Greg knows about the Italian soldier. Yes, there's a wonderful, my mother, well, before tonight, my mother and I were discussing um, her time um, in one of the occupied towns in Ukraine during the war, occupied by the Germans. The Germans had primarily occupied by Germans with small contingents of Viennese and Italians. And um, my mother had some wonderful memories of the Italian soldiers and how different they were from the Germans. Um, but is that referred to in the cooking? Uh, oh, it's no more than it's actually more than that. It was not just the cooking. Um, it was the uh, they would uh, w the Italian soldiers were uh, first of all. She said that they were really not very good soldiers, <laughs> but they were, <laughs> but they loved the music more than anybody else, and they would plead with with my mother and and Frida to let them come in to where they were staying there in this and, um, and to sit there and party with them and be with them and, um, and that they were just so emotional and so pleading and that they were so unlike the German soldiers, you know, who were, yeah. 
And um, she has wonderful memories of them, very fo uh, a lingering fondness for all those for those Italian soldiers. Isn't that right? She said they were. F she felt sorry for them because they were freezing. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's true. But uh, is Danny saying that mm. she felt sorry for the Italian soldiers because she knew they were coming from a war from a warm place and they were freezing like them. <laughs> and Flaminia, we're gonna go back to to Greg. But uh, how did you get the idea? Have the microphone. Don't be shy. Uh, your your idea to it's not my favorite place. <laughs> I know. To to make this film, how did you encounter this book? How did you get interested in it? Uh, just uh, I was in a summer in Italy and uh, from a magazine called Espresso was very highly recommended the book so I read it two days and two nights and I come back to United States and I say I have to call Greg Dawson and so I did call Greg he worked by then at the Orlando Sentinel newspaper and uh, he and he called me back and we got to talk and I say you know I am a filmmaker I love to do, you know, a documentary, and uh, we immediately, you know, uh, felt we could do it together because Greg was a big help, and we met in Atlanta, and uh, we met also also with Zanna, and uh, that's it. <laughs> this is how the docu film started. I have another question for Benedetta, who is uh, one of the two writers of the text. How did you work in the process of transforming? Uh, Greg's book into the script for whatever is script, uh, being a, a, a docu film, there is a part, of course, that is not scripted. There are the interviews with Greg and with uh, Irina and with the other protagonists. But how did you work in terms of transforming uh, Greg's book into the text of the film? Well, we worked together and we were, uh, we read the book first and we were uh, trying, because obviously, because it is a documentary, I think you have to keep like the idea as close to some historical truth as possible. So it, and like kind of, but the beauty of I guess of a docu film is that you can kind of like deliver the emotional truth a little more. And so that's that's what we try to do, and without being too I guess too narrative, but also kind of bringing everything together. So I guess this is the way we approach it. We just kind of took all the different parts of the book and tried to see how they would fit with like historic well like how they would like before even like historical footage and animation or other things came in we kind of had the idea though in mind of like what images would go with what and i don't know if like you want to <laughs> and erin mcguff is yeah. the other co-author of the of the well the book is told in such um a, a narrative way i mean it's easy it's almost feels like somebody is sitting and talking to you personally when t and telling you a story and uh, I l we loved that about the book. And it was really, we wanted to keep that. We wanted to preserve that feeling when we were writing the script. Um, and so we tried our best to do that. And we, we had a lot of hours sitting down with Flaminia as well and, and you know, uh, listening to her ideas and trying to kind of um, think about what visually, what it would look like and to, to support the visuals and um, instead of the other way around. That's kind of the difference, I think, from making it from the book into the film. Um, yeah. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Benedetta. Ste Stefano, yes. may I say at this point, this Absolutely. maybe anticipates a question you and I discussed beforehand, but one thing, watching the film again, I've seen it now, what, I don't know how many times I've seen it, but it, it's, one thing that strikes me is what a remarkable job you all did to, in compressing, condensing what is really an extremely complex story. This is a much more complicated Holocaust story than most, and I, no student of the Holocaust before I got involved in this story, but when I started looking at the ones that I'm familiar with, the most familiar texts, whether it's Knight, uh, Diary of Anne Frank, um, Schindler's List, um, any of the other stories, the, the Kinder Transport stories, all these are wonderful stories. But they're all really pretty straightforward and simple compared to this one because almost all the most famous Holocaust stories we're familiar with, the best loved ones, all have one thing in common, that's captivity, confinement, in an attic, a basement, a ghetto, a cave, a death camp. That's where almost all of them are confined to that. It's, and and it's, it's, uh, 
there are some others, but not many. But this one is not like that. They're, they weren't confined in that way. And it's a much more complicated story and with many, moving, many more moving parts than most Holocaust stories. And I thought they did a remarkable job of condensing what was a very complicated story into one hour. That I'm sure it was, and and uh, and I was struck again, uh, watching it. W what a really good job you did, uh, while at the same time, uh, working in making sure th that there was emotion and that there was a s that sense of of um, that personal sense of the narrative that you mentioned. And also, one other thing I want to mention that I thought was that was very good were the were the uh, you know you tried to do things in here that most filmmakers don't try to do elements such as the um, such as the graphic elements and the animation, um, which I thought were a couple instances very, very chilling when they were playing with the, the, the um, forgive me the artist's name, but his, the, 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 the black chalk or drawings that uh, were quite chilling of the, of the soldiers in the audience. Uh, so I you tried to do an, a lot in this film. I think you really succeeded. I must tell you, I was lucky because, uh, you know, probably you noticed all mostly kids performed in the docu film and i was lucky because these kids like three these three girls over here are no allegra they were really into the project they you know they spend hours with me and without studying or having fun and just immersing on the story and work uh, you know for me so you were you really the stars I think we have time for a couple of questions uh, from the audience. If there are any, we'd be uh, happy to entertain them. Yes, the lady back there, and then Alessandro. The question is, I repeat the question and then Greg, you go. Yes, the, the question the is, uh, yeah. uh, how did the older sister, uh, younger sister, the younger sister escape? It's clear what happened to Zanna. It's not clear what happened to the other sister. The, the, that's a very good question. It's one of the first questions that, that it's always asked. And the answer is, the reason it's not in there is that we don't know. Um, to this day, my mother doesn't know. Um, the only person who does know um, is Frina's now late husband, uh, died two months ago, um, sh who knows the entire story. Um, and Frina, uh, in the writing of the book, of course I approached Frina twice to be interviewed, to interview her for the book, because it's her story as much as my mother's. And she declined. And, and the second time, uh, her husband declined for her in writing. And he told me uh, that uh, he knew the entire story and that Frina just uh, felt that it was something, part of her life that she didn't want to speak to anybody about. And so I, I, of course, I respected that. I knew Frina growing up, and I loved Frina, and so I absolutely respected that. I never asked her again. Frina, her husband has now passed away. Um, uh, so that's why we don't know how it happened. can only speculate as to how she might have escaped. It we do. I do know now that the point at which my mother escaped was only about no more than a mile, probably less, from the killing field. So Frina either escaped in the manner my mother did, um, or uh, she may have actually made it all the way to the killing field and seen her parents and grandparents being murdered, may even have been thrown into a pit herself and had to climb out over dead bodies. There are documented cases of this happening. There was a wonderful book. Uh, written uh, uh, that starts with a scene like that. Everything is illuminated, um, turned into a wonderful movie, too. And that's the way that story, that movie begins. Um, could have happened that way. If that happened that way, Frina, who was two years younger, but much l less mature, extremely fragile compared to my mother uh, emotionally, you can imagine if she had witnessed uh, something like that, how it would have traumatized her profoundly in a way that would have shut her down uh, and made it incapable of revisiting those memories. So that's pure speculation on my part, but the answer is nobody knows since sh she didn't even tell, didn't even tell my mother. Thank you, Greg. Alessandro.
path, run into a synagogue where the children are looking at the house. So if you could just a little bit elaborate what the intention were with this kind of thing. You know, that is just the art artistic way of, uh, you know, wanting to do I, I interpreted the book and how I wanted to do it, just to be free to do it the way I wanted to do it. Uh, Greg, do you have something to add, for example, to the question of the blood test? Was that uh, uh, right? Because I felt I wanted her to Flem Flemmie to address that immediately because it was the last question you asked. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to address your question, um, m when we were doing interview, my mother told me that that. Uh, they had heard this rumor that you could tell a Jew by their blood. And so when it came time, that she had, uh, she, when it came time, they were very alarmed by this. Now, something that, this is a one hour, again, they did a remarkable job of condensing this very complicated story into one hour. There were many things that could not, uh, could not be included, of course. One is where my mother heard this, which may not exactly address all of your, your point, but she said that she had befriended uh, uh, a young woman who was a pharmacist. And that when she heard this rumor, she went to the pharmacist and was, it was, uh, was panicked. She said, I heard that this is, this is true. Is this true? And the pharmacist laughed and said, of course it's not true. And, um, and so then after being reassured uh, by her, they actually went to get their papers and when they went, they, they, uh, of course, they were not, uh, they had no, uh, uh, they had no fear of that. And, um, and in her telling of it, of course, they didn't take their blood. So it was, but it was a reality, the, the rumor had, was a very real reality to them in the midst of this, of this survival uh, journey that they were making. But, but that's a detail that, again, there just simply wasn't time to include all of that. Does that address any part of what your, your point? Just to let you know, the pharmacist were Russian and was a real pharmacist. Uh, oh, oh yes, this person, I mean, existed, yes, and uh, my mother could tell you more about her, but, but no, that's... Uh, oh, oh, the pharmacist. The pharmacist is in the movie? I missed it, where was it? Yeah, they go briefly. It's a very brief scene. Holy cow, I missed it. <laughs> 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 it's there. We really asked to a real pharmacist. No, but I think uh, Alessandro's question uh, related to the, to the footage and how you I'm so interact <laughs> with Can the... I, uh, I think you addressed the issue of the blood. So, of course, it was not true, but it was one of the many Sorry. rumors probably that went around these parts of Europe. They did not know exactly... So it was a rumor that your mom heard and then from somebody she found out that it was deprived of any foundation. Uh, but I think the question is, how do you uh, interact the, the real footage with the scenes that you've put in? And Alessandro, I think, was uh, sort of uh, puzzled by the fact that these uh, Dachau survivors, of course, in the images that yeah, you had, are, you are, are, are desperate and you know destitute and it sort of you know, there is contrast a, when you do a work like this, mm -hmm. uh, you get inspired. And, uh, you know, that was my inspiration. Also, the kids that was inside the synagogue, they are all Jewish, and they are all young kids. And I wanted them to know something about I w what I was doing and what they were doing. So through a reenactment story, they learn probably much more than they would have learned for you know, hours of histo well, you know, history class or history book. So each scene and each interpretation had a lot of thought. Nothing came casually. Everything was thought and rethought, but following what was my inspiration. Okay. Uh, we have time for another couple of questions. If we have any, yes? Relationship with, with Jewish people. 
I, I found that the film was, was inspiring, and I would hope that it can be an instrument. And uh, perhaps there's the collective memory, or perhaps there's the individual story, but the inspiration, the combination of the three, and I don't mean to put you on the spot by saying this, it kind of makes me think of the Bible, because not everything is actually accurate, written to inspire and to encourage uh, a story of salvation. And it's a story of salvation very clearly and very beautifully put, I thought. So uh, I hope that others will get to see this and, and be inspired as I was tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please make a comment. Um, any other question? Greg, I read that the book is has been published or is in course of being published in seven languages? To uh, no, just Three, uh, Italian, Three. French, and Korean. <laughs> and, and English. I, I, yes, English, yeah. <laughs> if you call that English. <laughs> and um, and um, some may wonder why Korean. Um, or maybe some might not, but I'll tell you anyway. My theory on that is that, uh, because this one, like the, rest of the, the others, is that, and this comes from my experience of, uh, of listening to my parents when they were teaching at the School of Music at IU in the 50s and 60s, th they had a large number of, of Korean students um, who were marvelous students, string and, and piano students. And I think that, um, um, that when my publisher said that, 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 could, that uh, there was a Korean publisher who was interested, I wasn't too surprised because I'd always remembered that uh, my parents talking about their wonderful Korean students. And I guess I'm no expert on what kind of cultural music uh, uh, culture there is in, in there is in the South Korea we're talking about, but um, but it must be very 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 strong. And that was the only reason I could imagine they would be interested in publishing the book in Korea. Um, so it's just those three languages. And uh, the one I, I'm really disappointed that hasn't been translated into, of course, is Russian. And I thought, knowing nothing about the publishing industry, I thought, well, that would be an obvious no-brainer. Of course, why not? It's their history in uh, Ukrainian and or Russian. But yeah, uh, it hasn't happened. And now that I visited Ukraine twice, I did a follow-up book uh, called Judgment Before Nuremberg, which was a closer look at the Holocaust in, in Ukraine and, and also at the way I came to write the book, which has a lot more about uh, how I learned about the story and, and how it affected our family. Having been to Ukraine twice, now I understand why it has not been published there, is that the Holocaust is still a very raw, open nerve um, in Ukraine, uh, especially in Ukraine, as opposed to uh, the rest of Russia or the old Soviet Union, because of the complicity of Ukrainians with the Germans. Not, not all Ukrainians, I hasten to add, um, because Ukrainians were complicit uh, uh, with the Germans in murdering Jews, but my mother would be the first to tell you it was also Ukrainians who saved her life, who put their own lives on the line by taking in Jews uh, and sheltering them, and had they been discovered, they would have been murdered along with the Jews. Nevertheless, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ambivalence, there's a lot of, of denial, buried guilt, raw nerves still today in Ukraine uh, about this subject. Uh, I had a remarkable discussion with a woman from Haikov, Harkov, Haikov, my mother's hometown, uh, who's 55, 50, 55, whose great-grandparents perished at Drabisky Yar, and she came to this country in 1989, and she is just starting a foundation to try to bring, shed more light, you know, on, to educate people about what happened in Ukraine and Drabitsky Yar. And she said that even growing up in Ukraine, uh, in the 80s, uh, as, a, as, a, as a student there, she didn't know anything about it at all. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. And, and she, they were not, uh, gentlemen said, no wonder, I don't know whether you're also from Ukraine, but, but that even in the 80s, <laughs> even in the 1980s, uh, Ukrainian kids weren't learning about th uh, about this, much less American kids. So, um, ah, yes, yeah. And, and by the way, d d I discovered, he mentioned, the gentleman mentioned, he said he grew up reading uh, 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 Yevtushenko's wonderful uh, poem, Babi Yar. I was amazed to find that, that Yevtushenko, you probably know this, also wrote a poem about Drabitsky Yar. 
and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful poem. Nobody knows about it, just as nobody knows that, I've just got to say this because I was startled that, uh, and the, the reason the book is called Judgment Before Nuremberg was that I discovered on my second visit to Ukraine the, the, the first trial of the Germans for their crimes, which did not occur, as I thought, at Nuremberg after the war, but in fact in Haikov in December 1943, uh, almost two years before the end of the war. The three Germans were tried and convicted and hung in the public square there for, the, for their crimes against the Jews. And actually, because it was Haikov, at least the three men who were convicted may not, if not literally, then figuratively, were the men who uh, murdered uh, my grandparents and my great-grandparents. Almost nobody in this country, including many Holocaust scholars I've talked to, uh, know about this trial. Um, and it's just now beginning to be written about by real scholars, not like me, but uh, there's going to be, you're going to hear and see and read more about this in the, in the next decade or two as this history comes to light. It really is the first chapter of the Holocaust which has been ignored. Not, there's no conspiracy of silence, it's a confluence of events which, is, which uh, has prevented the uh, light being shed on this, what really was kind of the Pearl Harbor of the Holocaust, which was the, was the, was the uh, uh, massacre of the Jews in Ukraine in 41, so. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, Flaminia looks as if she were under torture on this bench. <laughs> she's no, much I'm more, she's mu relax. She's much more comfortable behind the camera. Uh, so I, I just want to close because I think we had a very good, positive discussion. And now before you head out back into the snow, there is something for you to eat and drink upstairs. But before we go, I would like to thank again by name, Greg Dawson, the author of the book, Hiding in the Spotlight. <laughs> Flaminia Lubin, the director of the film. And we have there Benedetta Grasso and Erin McGuff, the writers of the film. <laughs> These three beautiful young ladies here who starred in the film, Matilda Ferri, India Daniel, and Barbara Baida. <laughs> but of course, we want to thank, first and foremost, again, Zanna Arshanskaya. Thank you.